we finally have an opportunity to see if our design for living breakwaters is beginning to work in Fisherman Bay. So it's been about a year now since we laid out about a thousand feet in total of oyster shellfish bed or living breakwaters foundations using burlap bags of dry shell and then seeding them in with half inch size seed oysters, young of the year seed oysters. The bags give us a simple way of laying things out like sandbags, easy to move, easy to contain material that otherwise would just be sloppy or require machines. And this was all done by hand, uh, just by a handful of people to set out these breakwater formations that will eventually become barrier oyster reefs protecting the very soft shorelines here. The, uh, the big surprise was that the, the bags, the, the biodegradable burlap bags, disintegrated a lot faster than we anticipated. We started out with bags that were two feet wide, and after they broke down, most of the shells stayed within that two feet, and there was a little bit of scatter, but it only extended to about four feet. So the structures remained in place through the winter without the retaining bags that we use to move the shells into place. That's important. That tells us that even under the different conditions at different sites here in Fisherman Bay, some with more current, some with less, some with stronger tides, some with more wind, that in all cases our structures stayed together and the shells are there to provide that platform for the living oysters. So what the next question was, of course, was what about those living oysters? Did they do well? Did they survive? Did they grow? Uh, did they grow fast enough that we could reasonably think that in five years, which was our planning horizon, they would be massive enough to significantly block currents and capture sediments? And as we worked through the shell, we found a lot of live oysters. They have grown. Look at that. <laughs> That's a the, lot bigger like than I it was. I think it was seeded <laughs> in when it was just about that big. And uh, now it is 55. 55, wow. That's so beautiful. It's... And yeah, not muddy, which is great. Yeah. And they've now grown big enough that they're not going to be as vulnerable to the typical predators of young oysters like green shore crabs and small uh, six-armed starfish. Interestingly, we had very different results at our different sites due to currents and tides and wind direction and predators, which is a major factor for people who grow oysters commercially or for home use here in the islands. Oh yeah, that's that one perfect. definitely settled. Settled in After the shell. we put it. Well, that's one of the things that really protects them. Mm -hmm. We expected a survival somewhere around 20 to 30 percent. Uh, we ended up with survival between 25 and 35 percent, which is to say a quarter to a third of the oysters that we scattered in the bags 10 months ago are still there and still alive and still growing. That's pretty good considering that they were completely unprotected and started out with shells so thin, the size of a dime, that you could easily break them with your fingers, and so could a crab. So we took a gamble that we could build a structure that would grow oysters fast enough and well enough that it could outstrip predation. 42? And it did pretty well that way. Had we had these little oysters in those big nylon mesh bags, we probably would still have half or more of them but without any protection at all, they did pretty well. 55? On average, these little tiny dime-sized oysters we started with grew to two inches, which means that they added 300% to their length in 10 months. It was heartwarming that in the end, our little oysters didn't disappoint us and they grew as well in these 
structures as they had in the pilot studies that we set up here in Fisherman Bay six years ago when we began thinking about doing this kind of biological construction. So they're definitely big enough now to fend for themselves against just about anything except a very hungry and determined river otter. And of course this is all experimental in the sense that nobody has done this quite this way before. We've got some more exposed shorelines and also some shallower, more protected shorelines. So we're going to get a sense from this about how to better design this kind of very simple construction. The most important thing, this is something that that any homeowner, any shoreline homeowner can do. It works with very simple uh, natural materials and hand labor and a little bit of serious thinking about alignment, about the geometry of beaches and the patterns of tides and currents, which were the basis on which we lined up and designed the curves and angles of the uh, beds that we built. But there are a few other interesting questions where we were less confident in what to expect. One of the most important ones was, would anything else move in? <laughs> and that's actually been the most fun in looking at these structures now, after 10 months of winter, is finding other animals that have worked their way into the structure and are now living with the oysters. Very wide range of marine organisms that you find in the intertidal zone here, from tube worms and sea anemones to the little shore crabs that are actually a predator to some of the other crustaceans that are not predators on oysters, but are important in our, um, in our food web, in our human food web, and fish. We found small fish in the structures as well. Uh, so one thing that is really important now is the recognition that animals in the bay are already colonizing the structure before the oysters have grown very much. So the structure itself, the shell structure on which the oysters are living, is already habitat. And that was part of the longer term vision of these living breakwaters, is they wouldn't just break up the energy of the water and grow a lot of oysters and trap sediments, but they would gradually become new habitat with new communities. And it's already begun in less than a year. That's very, very, very exciting. It's been only one winter, but four of our five structures have already built up over a half an inch and up to one and a half inches of sediment behind them on the shoreward side, which is to say that four out of five of the structures are already trapping measurable amounts of drifting sand that's coming out of the shore, out of the salt marshes along the shoreline, and would end up in the bottom of the bay or blown out the north entrance of the channel, but we've caught them. And they're now adding to the bulk, to the mass, of the breakwaters. I'd have to say, thinking about what we expected, what we hoped, and what we found, that the biggest surprise was that it's already working. <laughs> that's something that um, uh, we, we didn't dare to hope, but that's why we're going to continue working with landowners around the Bay who've graciously let us experiment on their property and continue to add oysters, monitor growth, see what moves in, and most importantly, share with the neighbors around us the technology that we've been experimenting with so that uh, perhaps more people will try it out and we'll get more experience in more parts of this bay and of course, hopefully, more good results in terms of having new habitat that will replace some of what we have lost and unfortunately will to an extent continue to lose because of our changing climate and changing oceans. <laughs>